Go ahead and turn in your Bibles to Isaiah chapter 11. Isaiah chapter 11. We'll be reading verses 9 through 12 in just a moment. We continue our journey from eternity to eternity. Tracking with sacred history, what God has been doing, what He's been up to in accomplishing all of His will and all of His glorious purposes. We have made it to the exile. We've spent a couple weeks here. Now we are pressing forward and looking toward the time after the exile, uh, the Babylonian captivity, and what was anticipated and then what God did. Isaiah chapter 11, verses 9 through 12. Hear now the word of the true and living God. They shall not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain. For the earth shall be full of the knowledge of Yahweh as the waters cover the sea. In that day, the root of Jesse, who shall stand as a signal for the peoples, of him shall the nations inquire, and his resting place shall be glorious in that day. The Lord will extend His hand yet a second time to recover the remnant that remains of His people from Assyria, from Egypt, from Pethros, from Cush, from Elam, from Shinar, from Hamath, and from the coastlands of the sea. He will raise a signal for the nations and will assemble the banished of Israel and gather the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. One more text. As we begin, Isaiah 42, and I want to read the first four verses of Isaiah 42, in addition to what we just read in chapter 11. Isaiah 42, beginning in verse 1, Behold, my servant, whom I uphold, my chosen, in whom my soul delights, I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the nations. He will not cry aloud or lift up his voice or make it heard in the street. A bruised reed he will not break and a faintly burning wick uh, wick he will not quench. He will faithfully bring forth justice. He will not grow faint or be discouraged till he has established justice in the earth and the coastlands wait for his law. Let us pray. Show us good and glorious things from Your Word this evening, Father. Be with us this evening. Help us. Give us eyes to see and ears to hear so that we might comprehend what You had in mind after the exile and how You fulfilled it in Christ Jesus, our Lord, we pray in His name. Amen. People are very good at complaining. That's why stores have complaint departments, right? Uh, it, it's, it's interesting to me. You know, you'll see these videos on YouTube or circulating on Facebook. You know, people are amazing and they're doing all these amazing things like kicking a ball through a hoop or whatever or throwing a baseball far and just, you know, threading the needle with something or doing a bunch of backflips. What I never see on there are people complaining, even though they're amazing at complaining, Right? Uh, complaining for some folks, it's almost a second language. Uh, you know, some folks take up Spanish, other folks take up French. Some people, it's just a second language to complain. Maybe even a first language for some. That's just the household in which they were raised. Uh, for many people, complaining is virtually effortless. It uh, comes very easily to them. And while people are good at complaining, they are rarely quick to offer a solution to the problem. Rarely are they speedy in providing a remedy. Uh, It is rare that someone would say, gee, I I really don't like this. Well, maybe we could. And then provide, man, can you believe this thing or that thing? Man, this is really bugging me. Hey, I got an idea. Let's do this, right? That's a rare quality for folks to have. Why is that? Well, I I believe folks uh, rarely 
think of a solution because, uh, well, for one thing, it's easier to find fault than it is to suss out a solution, to, to figure out the problem and, and work through it and work the problem in order to get the solution. It's far easier just to find fault and just to complain. And, and you know, people are the same everywhere. And so I'm, I'm fairly confident that there were a lot of complainers during the exile. If history is any predictor of future behavior, we know about the wilderness. The people of Israel got out into the wilderness and they griped. And, and God would provide and then they would gripe some more. And, and they, were just, they would complain and they would murmur. And, and so when they got into the exile, I can only imagine, they would complain about Babylon as a nation. You believe these people, these weird people, right? They complain about the king and the political system and and that Nebuchadnezzar really is no good. Or or they would complain about the weird foods that they had over there. Just just complain about any number of things and there was no shortage of things to complain about. And like today, I'm sure there were few who sought solutions to the problems that people were complaining about. I do think, though, there was a bright point that Daniel was a person who worked the problem. He was someone who would figure out a solution. And in the book of Daniel, chapter 9, we, we left off in the book of Daniel last week. Daniel 9 is an account, as we're getting closer to the end of exile, and chapter 9 here, the first two verses, this is Daniel sussing out the solution. He's working the problem and, and figuring this out. How long are we going to be in here in exile? And we're told in the first two verses, Daniel 9, verse 1, in the first year of Darius, the son of Ahasuerus, by descent of Mede, who was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, perceived in the books the number of years that, according to the word of Yahweh to Jeremiah the prophet, must pass before the end of the desolations of Jerusalem, namely... Seventy years. And so here is, is Daniel working out the solution, figuring out the solution for the predicament that the people are in. Lo and behold, it was through the prophet Jeremiah that God had predicted that the Babylonian captivity would only last for 70 years. And then the, the people would go back. There was the promise from God. Seventy years, and then he would restore the fortunes of Israel. Now, when God restores the fortunes of Israel, that brings us back to Isaiah 11. One thing that we're told is He would fill the earth with the knowledge of Him. Fill the earth with the knowledge of His glory. When God restores the fortunes of His people, it would also mean the knowledge of God would, would be broadcast the world over. So much so that even coastlands, the distant coastlands, would wait expectantly for the law of God. As we set the, the stage here, 70 years passes. Jeremiah predicted it would be 70 years before the exile even began. And then Daniel discovers while in exile that it would be 70 years. The date for that is usually uh, around 606 B.C. to 536 B.C. Uh, right around there. I mean, it depends upon exactly who you ask, but that's the typical date for the exile, and it's 70 years. It begins with the first deportation of the Jewish people in 606 under Nebuchadnezzar, and it concludes in 536 with Cyrus's decree to send the Jewish people back to go and rebuild the city and the temple and all that. And when that would happen, there would be this divine reversal. That's what we see in, in prophecy, in the prophetic literature. That guys like Isaiah and Jeremiah and, and Hosea and Amos, as they look past the exile, they see a divine reversal. And, and again, at the heart of that divine reversal had to do with knowledge. And the knowledge of Yahweh in particular. Come with me to Hosea chapter 4. In the book of Hosea, we have an explanation as to why the exile took place. What was the reason, one of the reasons, as to why the exile happened? What led to it? And in Hosea 4, verse 6, this is a memory verse if you want. Uh, here, keep this in your, your data bank, as it were. 
Hosea 4 verse 6 says, My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. You see, there's a direct connection here between a lack of knowledge, and I believe that's not just you know lack of knowledge about mathematics or science. or something. This is knowledge about God. And when they didn't have the knowledge of God, when they lacked that, it corresponded to their destruction. That is, the exile. My people, Yahweh's people, Israel, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because you have rejected knowledge, I reject you from being a priest to me. And so it especially starts with the, with the priests, but God's people generally have rejected knowledge of God. They don't want it. They've rejected His authority, and they have ignored God's law. Notice the rest of the verse. And since you have forgotten the law of your God, I also will forget your children. And so this, again, it results in, in exile. We see here, again, one of the reasons as to why the people of Israel went and ended up in exile, were dragged off into exile, was because a lack of the knowledge of God among them. And it is Isaiah who depicts the time after when God would restore the fortunes. And we read it there in Isaiah 11 and verse 9. Did you see the divine reversal here? Whereas prior to the exile, before the exile, because of a lack of knowledge, you're going into exile. After the exile... After the Babylonian captivity, now the knowledge of God will fill the earth. Not just His people, but all the earth. There in Isaiah 11 and verse 9, For the earth shall be full of the knowledge of Yahweh as the waters cover the sea. There's several contrasts here. Number one, we see that uh, God, before the exile, He specifically focused on my people are destroyed for life. My people, just the nation of Israel. After the exile, the primary audience for knowledge of God is going to be the whole earth. The earth is going to be filled with knowledge of Yahweh. Uh, before the exile, it, again, it's the people of God who rejected knowledge. And now after the exile, the earth is going to be filled. It's, it, it, it shall fill the, the whole earth. The knowledge of God is going to fill the entire earth. And then before the exile, God's people, they had forgotten the law of God, the Torah. After the exile... We read in Isaiah 42 and verse 4 that the distant coastlands are going to wait expectantly for the law, for the Torah of God as His knowledge is spread abroad. And so that's, that's at the heart of the return to exile. That's what was predicted prophetically. And so, I suppose initially when the people came back from the exile, they came back to the land and probably a lot of zeal Ah, now's the time. Now it will be that the, the knowledge of God is going to fill the earth. One of the first things they do, they, they lay the foundation for the temple. But then, as is often the case, that initial zeal wears off with time. And that foundation sits idle for quite a while. It requires that Haggai and Zechariah show up and, and they got to whip the people into shape and, and exhort them to, to finish what you started. Your guys' houses are in great condition. Meanwhile, this foundation is all full of weeds and overgrown and everything. Let's get busy. We got to build the temple of God. And, and they do. But once it's done, there's tears in the older members' eyes, uh, the older members of the community of Israel. They're, they're tearful because uh, they, they knew about the Solomonic temple. They knew what a great and impressive structure that was. And now, the second temple, it's not that impressive at all. And then, Nehemiah, he brings a group of people with him. And, and Ezra, they, they uh, lead uh, respective returns to the land by folks. And, and Nehemiah shows up and, and he's heartbroken. He takes a tour of the city and, and the wall is still, still torn down. And, and so he has to whip the people into shape. And 52 days later, they do have a wall around the city finally. Even though they've got enemies all around them. Sanballat and, and all the rest of these, these jokers out here are trying to stop the work, petitioning the king, saying, hey, these, these Jewish people, they're doing all kinds of stuff. And how does that work on behalf of His people then too? And, and they build the wall around Jerusalem. 
But still, after the temple is built and the wall is raised up, and what about that? The knowledge of God, it's not, it's not really being broadcast. And over time, what ends up happening is, well, we know that the Jewish religion turns inward. And they become very focused and, and very zealous for, them, for themselves and for the law. And, and it's, just, it's really focused on the Jewish people. Uh, a nationalistic zeal and zeal for the law, and it's not going anywhere. And then there were all those prophecies about, about that servant, that chosen one of Yahweh. And, and, and certainly there's the, the thinking that, well, the nation, Israel itself, is going to be that servant. But man, we, we can't really make those prophecies fit with what we're doing. It's not really working. You have those 400 years of silence, as they're sometimes called, that intertestamental period, and we'll deal with that in a couple of weeks. But again, there's that, that nagging suspicion that it's not, it's not the way it should be. Come with me to Habakkuk for a moment. Habakkuk, the prophet prior to the exile, is shown by God that the superpower that has replaced Assyria, the Babylonians, they're going to be used by God against Judah. Just as Assyria, over a hundred years prior, was used by God to bring judgment to the northern kingdom of Israel, God's going to do the same thing with Babylon to the southern kingdom of Judah. And uh, be not deceived, God is not mocked, even as He brought judgment upon the Assyrians for their wicked behavior, He would do the same thing to the Babylonians. What was required? And, and by the way, it's going to take a minute. It's going to take a while before you actually see God's judgment visited upon this wicked nation of Babylon. It seems slow. And in fact, that's the objection there in Habakkuk chapter 2 and verse 3. Habakkuk 2, 3, For still the vision awaits its appointed time. It hastens to the end. It will not lie. There may be a temptation. Where's he at? Here we are. We're, we're dying out here. Literally, there are those of us who are dying because of the Babylonians and they're carrying us off into exile. You said you were going to do something about these bad guys, God. Did you lie? It will not lie. If it seems slow, wait for it. Be patient. It will surely come. It will not delay. Behold, his soul is puffed up. The Babylonians and specifically Nebuchadnezzar. We chronicled some of that last week. It is not upright within him, but the righteous shall live by faith. The just shall live by faith. We know that text, don't we? Here's the original context. It was spoken in the context of, when are you going to punish the Babylonians? Just wait. Don't worry. They're going to get theirs. No one's getting a free lunch on me, God is saying. No one's going to game me. I know. And I will bring it to pass and in fact, well, notice verse 14. That once the Babylonians, the Chaldeans is how they're called here, once God brings them to nothing and causes them to be shamed and disgraced, Habakkuk 2.14, For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of Yahweh as the waters cover the sea. Oh, we've read that, haven't we? Yeah, that was Isaiah. And here's Habakkuk saying, Amen, that's right. The judgment itself that results in the shame and disgrace of the Babylonians will also bring deliverance for God's people. He's going to raise up a Cyrus. Isaiah talks about him. Names him by name. Cyrus is going to be raised up. He's going to send the people back. Deliverance for the people. And it's going to announce the goodness and the greatness and the glory of of Yahweh. This feeds what we've been talking about, one of the themes that we've been exploring, about how God is glorified in salvation through judgment. We see it again here. As He brings judgment upon and visits judgment upon the Babylonians, it will bring deliverance and salvation for His people, and God is going to be glorified to such an extent that the whole earth is going to be filled with His glory. So what do we do with this? 
what are we to make of this? And, and how did this come to fruition? Isaiah 11. We notice verses 10 and 11. It talks about that day. That's significant. In that day. In that day. It's repeated. Isaiah here, it, through the eye of prophecy, is describing a day when a shoot from the stump of Jesse is going to come forth. That's verse 1. Way back in Isaiah 11 and verse 1, there shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse. And then uh, here in verse 10, in that day, the root of Jesse. Jesse, who Jesse? Who, who's Jesse again? Oh yeah, that's right. That, that, was, uh, that was David's daddy. King David. That was Jesse was his father. Oh, so, so there's going to be this... Um, this one like David. This Davidic king, if you will. Ah, oh, ears perk up. Ah, oh, God's going to send His king. And, and in that day, uh, verse 11, that's when God, the Lord, Adonai, He's going to extend His hand a second time to recover the remnant. The remains of His people. The remnant of His people. Ah, oh, remnant of His uh, that's a very significant theme throughout your Old Testament prophecy. And it had to do with the return back to exile. It would only be in a remnant that came back. But then we talked briefly about how that remnant idea shows up in the New Covenant. And how it included not just uh, Jewish believers, but Gentile believers as well, are now the remnant of God. God, He promises in Isaiah 10 that there would be judgment upon the Assyrians and Number one, he would use them to Assyria to bring judgment upon his people, but then he would turn around and judge them for their wickedness and for their pride and arrogance and all that. And then there would be this restoration. A remnant will return, we are told in 10 and verse 21. And then this one is coming, this shoot from the stump of Jesse, this root of Jesse. And on him, notice 11 verse 2, the Spirit of Yahweh will rest upon him. So you have this shoot who is apparently the same as the servant of Yahweh, the chosen one of God. We make the connection, that's the Messiah. That's Christ. God's Son. And notice the Trinitarian aspect of this, how it would be the Son who was sent by the Father upon whom the Spirit would be. And that's the Spirit also of the Father. He's going to be the one who arises. And He will, uh, we, we notice here, He's going to, uh, verse 12 of Isaiah 11, He will raise a signal for the nations. Yeah, but how do we know? How do we know that this is applicable to the New Testament and, and ought to be carried over to the work of Christ and to the church? That's a good question. We know it because, well, the Apostle Paul quotes it in Romans chapter 15. Uh, come with me there uh, quickly. Romans chapter 15. And we read here in verse 8, pick up the reading in Romans 15 verse 8. Paul writes here, he says, For I tell you, Christ became a servant. Ooh, servant. Oh yeah, there's Isaiah 42 in the background. In fact, it's really all of Isaiah 40 to 55, 56. You know, that's the whole servant hymn in Isaiah. The song of the servant, including the suffering servant in chapter 53. Ah, servant. And that's Christ. That's Jesus. Christ became a servant to the circumcised, that would be the Jewish people, to show God's tru uh, truthfulness in order to confirm the promises given to the patriarchs. All those promises made to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, guess what? Jesus, the Messiah, the Christ, fulfills all that and is showing God is truthful. He didn't lie. It will not lie. Yeah, that's, that's Habakkuk in the background there echoing for us. So Jesus, He's the one who confirms all those promises for the Jewish people. But then Paul doesn't stop there. In verse 9, he says, in order that the Gentiles might glorify God for His mercy. Now notice that here, here are the Gentiles, the nations. And God is showing mercy to them. And, and Jesus is the reason for that. He's the one who brings it about that the Gentiles glorify God for His mercy. They praise, we praise and honor 
God, because He has been merciful to us, that God in Christ has shown mercy to the nations. And even that is a fulfillment, a confirmation of the patriarchal promises. It was one of the first promises given to Abraham when he was still Abram, way back in Genesis chapter 12. All families of the earth will be blessed in you. And now here, it's coming about that God is doing it. Verse 10. Beginning in verse 10, Paul begins to throw verse after verse of this. He's just going to start quoting verse after verse from the, the Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible. Um, well, the, the end of verse 9. As it is written, therefore, I will praise you among the Gentiles and sing to your name. And again, it is said, rejoice, O Gentiles, with his people. And again, praise the Lord, all you Gentiles, and let all the peoples extol him. And again, here it is, verse 12. Isaiah says, and this is Isaiah 11, the root of Jesse will come, even he who arises to rule the Gentiles, in him will the Gentiles hope. Now, it reads a little differently, and that's because Paul is leaning into the Greek translation of the Hebrew Old Testament. That's called the Septuagint. And so there's a slight difference in the reading, but net, net, what you end up with is the Messiah, the root of Jesse, who would come. He's going to rule the, gen rule the nations, and the Gentiles, the nations, are going to hope in Him. And Paul is saying that is exactly what is happening. Jesus is the full and final fulfillment of God's promise of restoration of a remnant of His people. A remnant even chosen by grace, Paul says in Romans 11, verse 5. Jesus is also the final and full, the, the full and final fulfillment of God's promise to fill the earth with His knowledge. Even the knowledge of His glory. We see the Gentiles, they're glorifying God. They, they know about the glory of God and they give glory to God because now they know Him. Think about this. Filling the earth with the knowledge of God. Isn't that what we do with the Gospel? As we live out the Gospel in our lives, I mean, we're... I believe we're all Gentiles here, right? And yet as we live it out and, and we, we glorify and we worship God, we're filling the earth with knowledge of Him. As we tell the Gospel and preach the Gospel and, and the message goes round the world, the knowledge of God is filling. It's, it's covering the world as waters cover the sea. There are Christians not only here in America, but... There are Christians in Europe, in Africa, in South America, in China, in Russia. Christians all over the world. That's, that's God, through Christ, filling the earth with His knowledge. The knowledge of God is filling the earth. Right now, today, it's happening. Think about how the kingdom started. How did it start at the beginning? There were what, 11 guys? They didn't know what to do, right? They went and holed up in a room in Jerusalem for a little bit. Well, I guess we should replace Judas. That seems like a good thing to do right now. Right? They, they do that in chapter 1, but they don't know what to, do, what to do. Go to Jerusalem. Wait for power to come to you from on high. And that's what happens in Acts chapter 2. And by the way, in Acts chapter 2, what do you have? You have people from all over the Roman Empire. all People from different tribes and languages and nations and all the rest. And they're there in Pentecost and they hear the Gospel preached about 3,000 people are converted, and guess what? They take the Gospel with them back to the places where they live. And the knowledge of God begins to fill the earth. God begins, and, and, and He continues to build His kingdom all over the world in the first century, but then it's just a matter of time. Throughout history, we see the Gospel being, play, being taken to all these different places, and wherever it goes, whatever tribe or nation or people or language is spoken, People hear the Gospel, they believe, they repent of their sins, and they're obedient to Christ. He's filling the earth with His knowledge. And that continues today. We continue to fill the earth with the knowledge of God. This is the full and final fulfillment of Isaiah's prophecy. Where it went beyond the exile, and it went beyond the return even. Yes, they came back, but... God does something even greater 
through His servant, the suffering servant. That when Jesus comes and lives a sinless life and goes to the cross and dies on the cross as the Lamb who takes away the sins of the world, that God is making known. He is showing Himself glorious in judging sin, but in saving a people. And He's glorified in that. And the knowledge of His glory in the cross is taken all over the world. And it's found its place right here in the Central Valley of California. Right here in Modesto. Right here in in the hearts of my brothers and sisters and those watching online. Yes, the Lord is filling the earth with His knowledge. But then there's that other thing here where this root of Jesse, Romans 5, verse 12, that will come. And that's, that's Christ. And He did come. Even He who arises to rule the Gentiles, and that could be translated to rule the nations. And you can take this back also and, and connect it with Isaiah 42, which we read at the beginning. How this servant, this chosen one of Yahweh, is going to bring forth justice to the nations in verse 1 of Isaiah 42. And then in verse 4, He is going to establish justice in the earth. Hmm. And before I get too far, notice again the Trinitarian nature of this. You have the servant, that's the Messiah, Christ, God's Son. He is my chosen. That is the chosen of Yahweh, and I believe that's the Father who is choosing His Son, And then Yahweh says, I have put my spirit, the spirit of Yahweh, is on him, the servant. This answers, in part at least, the question as to why God must be three in one in order to accomplish redemption. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, working in harmonious union with one another to accomplish all of their good and glorious purposes. But then notice, again, he's going to establish justice. He's going to rule the nations. He's going to establish and bring forth justice to the nations. What's what's being said here? Christ is Lord of the nations. That's what's being communicated. Christ is Lord of the nations. It's pictured here prophetically through Isaiah, here in Isaiah 42, this prophecy concerning Messiah. This is quoted also in the New Testament. Uh, In in Matthew chapter 12, verses 18-21, through it's quoted at length. And that this chosen one, Yahweh's servant, the same servant who's going to suffer in chapter 53, mind you, who's going to suffer on behalf of His people. This same servant is going to bring forth justice among the nations. He's going to work tirelessly in in verse 4. He will not grow faint or be discouraged. He's going to work tirelessly, relentlessly to establish justice on the earth, in the earth. And then the coastlands, the distant coastlands is the idea there. They wait expectantly for His law. That is Christ's law, the servant's law. And and by the way, let me just uh, mention here, justice, this is not not, uh, the justice so-called today that is rooted in social standards and values. Social justice, right? That is often the product of the minds of unregenerate people that that aims so low that it misses the biblical mandate and, and true biblical justice. This is justice according to God, which is so much more uh, fully fledged than any kind of concept of justice that we come up with, disconnected from God. And in fact, the word here for justice, mishpat, in the original, is can also be rendered as judgment. Hmm. Judgment. What is it that What is it that God is doing in Christ on the cross? He is judging our sins. And as Christ is taking upon Himself the full fury of the the Father, the Father's wrath being poured out and exhausted in Him, justice and judgment is being meted out for our sins. And He's satisfying that. God is passing judgment upon people's sins 
in the Son on the cross. And that means that since the wrath of God for our sins has been fully satisfied in Christ, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And that is the greatest judgment that could ever take place in the earth. And that's what's filling the earth. As people are being loosed from their sins by the Gospel, Messiah is filling His world with justice. He's judging the hearts of people. And then He is ruling in their hearts as their King. This is the glorious work of Christ our Lord. What He does on the cross in His life, His ministry, His death and resurrection, He's bringing justice or judgment upon the earth. He's fully satisfying the just requirements of God for sin. The righteous requirement of the law. He fulfills by His obedience in a sinless, perfect life. But then that righteous requirement of the law is fulfilled in us. Not because of us, anything we've done. Because of Jesus. And because we are in Him. And since the first century, Christ has been bringing forth justice in the earth. In justifying sinners and in teaching people how to live and move and have their being by behaving in a way that is pleasing to God in upright and godly ways. And then through the Gospel, people all over the earth and the nations, they do. They hope in His name. They hope in the name of Jesus. King Jesus, He brings kingdom justice to the earth. So much so that even distant coastlands Wait expectantly for His good, holy, and spiritual law. That is the distant coastlines. Those are Gentiles. Those are the nations that are waiting expectantly for His law. And where the Gospel goes, now we will see a a people, God raising up a people from among all, all of humanity, lost sinners who hear the Gospel and they, they hear the glory of Christ and, and they submit. Uh, they're given a new heart. They submit to the law of God and they look upon it as good and, and now they're being trained to renounce worldliness and, and ungodliness and to live self-controlled, upright and godly lives in this present age. Yes, this is what Isaiah foresees, what he predicts. This is what God foretold long ago, and this is what is fulfilled in Christ. And on a daily basis, as His Gospel goes out and His law is loved, as people in their love for God keep His commandments, His commandments are not burdensome. But there is, what shall we call it, the Habakkuk conundrum? Where we we look at the world with... So much violence and and sin. And and there's a temptation to think, well, it it doesn't look like Christ is ruling among the nations, right? I mean, in fact, it kind of looks like the world's out of control the way things are going. What do we do when by all appearances it looks like Christ is not now ruling the nations? And again, the temptation is to acquiesce and kind of resign ourselves to Uh, the conviction that, well, I guess He isn't. Humans are doing what they do, or or Satan's in control, and and, uh, both humans and Satan, they're doing whatever they want, and and Christ, He kind of has His hands tied in the whole thing, you know, like, I'm doing the best I can, and Christ doesn't have any control over this present world. That's a temptation, and there are some Christians who've bought into that. However, What is it Christ says? The end of Matthew's Gospel. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. All authority. All of it. Not some, not most, not, you know, whatever I can get. And you guys can... All authority in heaven, on earth has been given to Him. Scripture affirms this. In 1 Corinthians 15, verse 25, Christ must reign until He puts all His enemies under His feet. Which is a direct allusion to Psalm 110 where the Father bids His Son rule in the midst of your enemies. And Yahweh does rule. Christ rules over the nations. And here is where Habakkuk can help us. The Habakkuk conundrum. Where it doesn't look like it, what do we do? 
Back to 2, verse 3 of Habakkuk. It seems slow. And yes, if you've ever done any personal work, you know it's very personal and it can be very slow. It takes time. It takes patience. If it seems slow, wait for it. Wait for it. It will surely come. It will not delay. And then we see again the end of verse 4. The just shall live by faith. Faith in the fact that Christ is indeed reigning and ruling. It doesn't look like he's, He must reign. He is reigning right now. He is ruling in the midst of His enemies. He, listen, He has shamed and disgraced proud and arrogant kings and nations in the past. But it was according to His timetable. Not ours. John writes the Revelation near the end of the first century. I mean, it depends exactly when. There's early date, middle date, late date, and all that. But it sits near the end of the first century. What's that about? Well, I don't believe we're of the ilk who want to shove all that into the future even yet for us, but rather that there was historical fulfillment as John is given this revelation by Christ of what he, how he is going to conquer the Roman nation and how the Roman nation, the Roman Empire, is going to be just another uh, enemy that he's going to put under his feet. It took over 200 years before Christianity was even legal in the Roman Empire. It wasn't until the Edict of Milan in 312 that Christianity was finally legal under the Roman Empire. It would wait until Constantine allowed that. And even then, the Roman Empire, it'll limp along for a couple few centuries. But eventually, and finally, it wheezed its last gasp. We know that historically. Yeah, you had the Holy Roman Empire, but it wasn't Holy or Roman for that matter, right? Not much of an empire either. And yes, you had, I mean, at times there was the, the conflation of uh, church and state where you had like bishops in Rome who were taking political power. And so you had like Leo the Great and Gregory the Great in the 5th and 7th centuries respectively. But slowly and gradually according to his timetable. Listen, sometimes he does it overnight. That's what happened with Babylon. The Medo-Persian Empire dried up an aqueduct and marched under the wall and took control overnight, literally. But then sometimes, if it seems slow, wait for it. Same thing is done even today. Christ is ruling the midst of His enemies and He is putting all of His enemies under His feet as His footstool. Christ must reign. Hallelujah. Let us pray. Lord God, we rejoice in the hope of glory. That is that You will glorify Yourself here and now in this world through Christ. We praise You, King Jesus, for the work that You are doing in the midst of Your enemies. We pray that You would continue to conquer the nations. That You would uh, bring your sheep into your fold and that you would do so in marvelous and glorious ways so that we can only acknowledge that you are King of kings and Lord of lords. We are unworthy servants. We have merely done our duty and you have done glorious things. They are marvelous in our eyes. We commit all this to you. The glorious name of Jesus. Amen. Amen.